Many thanks to the organizers. It's really a great location to hold mathematical conferences. It's not my first time here, and it's a great pleasure to come back. Uh, so this is a very long title, and it's not clear what will be happening now. I will start with some kind of analogy between analysis and algebra, analogy between uh, polynomials and uh, Laplace eigenfunctions. This analogy, it sets some kind of expectations. You can take some interesting question about polynomials and make an interesting question about eigenfunctions. Um, I will talk about one very narrow question, which is formulated very analytically, some kind of inequality, some kind of question about distribution of values. Uh, and there was an abstract, and I did not explain why I will be talking about that. I will try to do it now. So this is a problem where I'm not a specialist in. So this is a problem in algebraic geometry. Uh, it's about zero sets of polynomials, more specifically zero sets of homogeneous polynomials of three variables. Since they are homogeneous, their values are described by the restriction to the sphere. You can look at the sphere and you can look at the zero curves of homogeneous polynomials and you can ask a question, some questions about that. For instance, Gilbert was interested, how many curves can you see? Uh, and can you describe the topology, their position of these curves relative to each other? Uh, the first part, yeah, was solved by Hardnett. You can estimate the number of those curves and there is a specific estimate, which is roughly if you have a homogeneous polynomial of degree n, then the number can be estimated from above by some, something specific, which is roughly n squared. And uh, other things like relative positions of this curve is a hard problem. Probably it's solved up to degree, I don't remember, seven or eight. Uh, here is another question. It's again about homogeneous polynomials, but here you have an additional structure, like assume for a moment that in addition, you know that a polynomial is a harmonic function. And then you can see a picture. This is uh, uh, the sign of a spherical harmonic. So spherical harmonics are restrictions of homogeneous harmonic polynomials. And you can see here that the zero set is very structured in some sense and uh, chaotic in another sense. And this is the sign of some random spherical harmonic of degree 50. And you can ask the same questions here, like try to estimate the number of curves, the number, okay, some topological quantities, complexity of the picture. Um, this additional structure like um, that comes from Laplace equation, when you try to rewrite it in intrinsic terms of the sphere, like when it comes from dimension three to a two dimensional sphere, this function, they become a solution to a different PD. So it's restriction satisfies, uh, um, I, I, I don't know. So these functions are called uh, uh, Laplace eigenfunctions, which satisfy the PD below. And there is a relation that the eigenvalue is roughly the square of the degree of the polynomial. Um, so in this particular question, yeah, you can, the, to, the question of estimating the number of the nodal curves, um, there is an answer which is quite general. It's so general that uh, it's quite surprising. So you can consider any Riemannian manifold, like any closed Riemannian manifold, no boundary and compact. Uh, and there is a, a sequence of special functions, which are called Laplace eigenfunctions, which satisfy this kind of PDE. And uh, there is some parameter like the eigenvalue, which is allowed to take only discrete set of values, which goes to infinity. You can arrange the eigenfunctions in the increasing order of the eigenvalues. And uh, 
the remarkable theorem of current, which is very general, it's true in any dimension for any manifold of any topology, that the case eigenfunction has, uh, okay, in dimension two, you can estimate the number of uh, curves, but more proper formulation is instead of estimating the number of curves, you look at the number of nodal domains, which are kind of connected components of the complement of the zero set. So here you can see a picture. There is one uh, zero curve and it separates the square or the torus into two connected components, just two, uh, if you carefully look here. And this connected components are called nodal domains. And the current theorem tells us that there are at most k nodal domains uh, for the case eigenfunction. Uh, and this is roughly consistent with what you have uh, for polynomials on the sphere. Uh, there are two specific cases when uh, eigenfunctions are exactly polynomials, when you have a sphere, a high dimensional sphere or high dimensional torus. And those two settings are already interesting to study. Like you can pose some questions for polynomials and you can try to guess what, what will be happening on the sphere. And there are many questions for the sphere which are open. Um, even if it's like, if you impose this additional structure. Uh, okay, uh, and here is a philosophical point that is not truly mathematical, but it gives some expectations that uh, the eigenfunctions, they should behave like polynomials and the, the analogy between the degree of the polynomial and the eigenvalue, the coefficient that appears in this equation that is that the degree is roughly the square root of the eigenvalue. Uh, it's not clear how to work with solutions to this PD. It's something very non-explicit. Uh, and I will tell you later about some techniques that help to study some quantitative properties of solutions to PD, like the number of zero curves. Um, here is a, a slightly more complicated question, um, which was raised by uh, Donnelly and Pfefferman. So imagine that you have a sphere, you look at your uh, spherical harmonic, and then uh, you take a piece of your sphere, like some ball of some radius. You can take very, very small scale ball or very, very large ball. It could be any, anywhere. And uh, this kind of picture hints us that the nodal domains they are, they should be in some sense equidistributed. They couldn't happen that there are too many nodal domains or nodal curves that intersect a specific ball. Um, and uh, there is an answer that roughly suggests that if you fix a ball, then the number of nodal domains that are inside of this ball should not be bigger than uh, something that is proportional to the volume of the ball, which is kind of very natural. Um, so this is a, a, a problem that uh, imposes like some purely analytic question that I will talk later. So this is later, there will be one very specific analytic question and uh, which helps to understand some kind of local distribution of nodal domains. I will not be able to explain in a good way why that question is helpful, but let me, before going to there, I'll mention another open problem. And we hope that that kind of uh, analytic question is helpful here. So this is a, a kind of very old question. So it comes from uh, acoustic experiments. When you have a, a metal plate, you put some sand particles on top of it. And say, if you go to the mathematics museum in Geneva, they give you a bow, a violin bow, and you're allowed to strike this metal plate with sand on top of it by this violin bow. And you do it like multiple times, like 10 or 20. And sometimes accidentally you can see that the sand starts to accumulate 
along some visible curves when the metal plate is vibrating in a certain way. Um, and um, the picture that you may obtain, it kind of depends on the strength, how strong do you hit the plate at the location where you fit. And it's kind of mysterious, but why is it happening? Uh, but those curves, they can be described as zero sets of special functions, which are again solutions to PD. But unlike the previous setting, this is a more complicated PD of fourth order. And uh, there is a very old question, like to understand, like for instance, the number of these nodal curves, like Ernst Kladner was conducting this experiment. He made the, uh, a prediction for the special case when you have a circular plate that how many curves you should you see, but basically, except for this special case, this empirical prediction, uh, there is no, uh, not even one uh, effective bound for the number of these curves. And when you look at the proof of the Quarren's nodal domain theorem, the very, the the statement that the case eigenfunction of a simpler equation of the Laplace operator. Uh, the current proof completely breaks down and we are trying to fix it to make another approach to which is working for, for this particular problem. Uh, okay, uh, here is my motivation. And now I will tell you about some obstacles which appear when you try to look at nodal domains or the zero curve. So here is a, an example of a spherical harmonic, which is called like orange spherical harmonics. Orange because uh, it's zero curves, they remind slices of orange. Um, this is um, uh, a function on the sphere, but you can, yeah, spherical harmonic, you can construct looking at three dimensional harmonic polynomial. And in this case, the harmonic polynomial does not depend on one of the variables. So it's kind of translation invariant. And uh, it's zero set, when you look carefully, the zero set of the spherical harmonic is, uh, uh, is looking like N circles that intersect at North and South poles. And uh, the problem here is um, that you can't really see well numerically what is happening near the North and South Poles. So if you near the equator, then the function is uh, roughly comparable to one. It oscillates a little bit, but it's uh, values are around one. But when you go closer to the North Pole, say you take a cap of radius one half, then the values inside of this cap, they are so small, they're exponentially small in the degree. And numerically, it's very hard to see whether the function is positive or negative if it's exponentially small. So when you try to estimate the number of nodal domains, and when you see this intersection, you can make like small perturbations that change the number of nodal domains and this curves dramatically, you have somehow to take into account this exponentially small values. And I will slowly be moving towards the analytic question about distribution of values. So here is some, a question. First a version is the following. You take a Riemannian manifold, you look at Laplace eigenfunctions, uh, you take and normalize it in a such a way, say that the integral, the L2 norm, uh, is one, uh, and uh, then you take uh, a smaller subset of the manifolds, like say well, a ball, and you would like to compare the values inside of the ball with the values on the rest of the manifold. Uh, and you can ask how small it can be. Uh, and uh, another statement, like another question, second one, and it's more complicated one. So you take a very tiny number epsilon and you would like to look at all points on the manifold where the eigenfunction is uh, smaller than epsilon. 
in absolute value, and you try to estimate the volume of the thing. So the second question is harder than the first, and, uh, but it's more useful in understanding um, like the number of nodal domains. I will not be able to explain why the second thing is helpful, but it's really, really helpful to understand the number of nodal domains. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about, I, I just cannot skip this part uh, because there is one recent and great result by Simeon Dyatlov and many other co-authors, um, which states uh, something about distribution of values on negatively curved two-dimensional surfaces. So in the example that I mentioned before, uh, the orange spherical harmonic, when you look at the L2 mass, like you look at the square of the function and uh, you look how the L2 mass is distributed on the sphere. In that example, the mass was very localized near the equator and near the northern, near the north and south pole, the, there was almost no mass. And this was for the sphere, but if you have a negatively curved surface, then uh, it's completely different. And there is very mathematically interesting paper, a series of papers where it is proved that on every uh, open set, say a bowl, there is a portion of the L2 mass of eigenfunctions. And it's highly non-trivial result. And it's a part of, uh, which is called like quantum ergodicity conjecture, conjecture with uh, scary words inside of it. So Peter Sarnak and Zeev Rudnik, they conjectured that for negatively curved surfaces, even say for constant uh, negative curvature, the distributions of the eigenfunctions, like of, okay, of the squares of the eigenfunction in some average sense, uh, they converge to the uniform measure. Um, that's what is happening for negatively curved surfaces. I had to mention that, but uh, in, in the general case, like in particular for the sphere, it may happen that you have regions like a cap or, or a huge bulk of a manifold where the values are exponentially small in, in square root of the eigenvalue. Um, and if you take a ball, uh, some of fixed radius on the manifold, then there is a lower bound for, for the supremum over the ball, which is like exponential in the square root of lambda. It also becomes worse when the radius of the ball becomes smaller and smaller. Uh, and uh, it was non-trivial and non-obvious to understand like uh, the distribution for small values, like say you have a, um, okay, let me formulate the question in a different way. Say instead of a ball, you have like a set of positive measure, but like arbitrary set. Can you estimate the supremum of some kind of wild complicated set? And here is a partial answer that you can estimate the volume just of, of a, a sub-level set of, of the eigenfunction. And uh, there is a long road, which I cannot explain right now, but it helps to bound the number of nodal domains in particular that gives you a local bound for the local version of Corrin's nodal domain theory. Uh, okay, so this will I skip, but uh, I want to tell you a little bit about the uh, tools from analysis, which I find interesting and which are helpful to prove uh, estimates for eigenfunctions. Uh, and at the end, I will like to mention one limitation of this method, like what is a challenge and we are rather stuck there than can really use the current techniques to overcome it. So, but here is a nice thing, a very powerful tool in PDE, uh, which is called monotonicity formulas. Uh, what is it telling about that if you have a solution to PDE and you're trying to understand its behavior, then there is um, 
kind of a half invariance, which is monotone with respect to some invariance. Say you take a ball and this half invariant gives you a number associated to a ball, which is monotone with respect to the radius of the ball. And uh, this half invariant is called like frequency. Uh, it's can be defined for harmonic functions on Riemannian manifold, but say here in the case of Rn, what is happening, you take a sphere of radius R, you take the average of the square of harmonic function over the sphere, and these averages, they grow. And uh, uh, there is a frequency uh, which tells you how fast the L2 norms over restriction to the spheres grow when you change the radius. So this is something like logarithmic derivative of L, L2 norm over a sphere of radius R. And it tells you how fast the L2 norm grows. And here is a powerful fact. It's not really clear how to use it at the moment. I will try to tell a little bit of how to apply it, but um, the fact says that the frequency is monotone in the radius. And in some sense, this kind of monotonicity formal, it's uh, related to logarithmic convexity property. Um, so it's, this fact is um, a statement about second derivative of L2 averages, but um, it's more about logarithm of the function than about L2 norm, sorry. It's, and it's helpful to understand like why the eigenfunctions cannot be like extremely small on some portions of the manifold worse than exponentially small. Um, so there is um, another notion of growth which is called doubling index, both frequency and doubling index that tell us about the growth of harmonic function. And in the case of the doubling index, you work with L infinity norm instead of L2 norm. You just take supremum over uh, some ball and divide it by the supremum over twice smaller ball and take the logarithm of this ratio. And this number, okay, this is some positive number which tells us how fast a harmonic function is growing. And uh, these numbers are comparable, like frequency and the doubling index, it's more or less the same thing. You can estimate one by another. But what I'm trying to say here that you should think about the frequency and about the doubling index as a function of a set. You give it a ball, it gives you back a number. Uh, and uh, there is some kind of collision of notations. Yeah, you would like to write some radius here. You, you should put here also harmonic function, but let's please think that you always put a ball inside of the function that gives you a number. Um, um, so what is the frequency uh, for polynomials? For If you have a, a homogeneous harmonic polynomial, then the frequency is exactly the degree of the polynomial up to this constant factor two. And uh, if it's not a homogeneous harmonic polynomial, but just linear combination of homogeneous harmonic polynomials, then uh, it's bounded from above by the degree. It's, uh, here is uh, another thing about the frequency that say, if you take a ball of very, very small radius and let this radius go to zero, what happens with the frequency for tiny, tiny balls? It converges to, to the vanishing order at the point, like vanishing order tells us how deep is the zero at the particular point. So you write Taylor series and uh, the first term that is not zero in Taylor series gives us the vanishing order. Okay, so um, here is what we expect that harmonic functions, okay, you can think about harmonic functions with uh, frequency comparable to some number n as uh, of polynomials of roughly degree this number. Uh, in particular, what is true, you can, for harmonic functions, you can estimate some 
uh, complexity properties of zero set, you can estimate topology of the zero set purely in terms of this number, like analogy, which is holds for polynomials applies here. Um, um, let me skip this thing. Um, okay, here, here is a curious thing. So uh, very powerful fact uh, is that the frequency is a monotone function when you change the radius of the ball, but say if you take two non-concentric balls, I say you shifted the center of the smaller ball, it's still kind of monotone, like it's almost monotone. And when analysts say that something is almost monotone, they mean that there is inequality with some kind of constant, like 10 or 100. And it's true that if you take a ball and a slightly smaller ball that is strictly inside, then you have this kind of inequality. So it's almost monotone. Please think about that as of uh, a monotone, almost monotone function of a set. And then uh, some kind of question. So usually like what kind of uh, functions of the set we know, there are measures like positive measures that are monotone with respect to set inclusion and frequency is extremely mysterious creature. It's not additive as a measure, but it has some uh, additivity properties. And here is example, which is not real additivity, but some kind of weak version of additivity. So imagine that you have a, a several balls, like here is a picture in a three-dimensional space. You have four blue non-intersecting balls and you calculate the frequency in each of those blue balls. Uh, and then you take a giant red ball that contains all of them and you would like to compare the frequency in this balls with the frequency in the bigger set like whether you have some additivity or strict increments um, and here is a fact which is not real additivity but say if in each of the balls the frequency is bigger than some number a then uh, the frequency in a giant ball that contains all all of them is uh, strictly bigger than a, it's bigger than a times a constant strictly bigger than one. Um, and we don't really have the additivity property. Here is example, which says the opposite thing. So if you take this uh, orange spherical harmonic, okay, but now you look at it as of harmonic function in three-dimensional space, it's invariant with respect to shifts along the z-axis. If you take uh, the ball we center at the origin, it's homogeneous harmonic polynomial, the frequency is exactly the degree. And when you shift the ball along the z-axis, it's, it's everything is invariant. So for every ball we center at the z-axis, the frequency is the same. But so you can take a collection of non-intersecting balls with centers at the z-axis and the, the frequency is all the same, but uh, if you take a giant red ball that contains all of them, you don't have any accumulation. And uh, um, the thing is, so the first um, statement was that you have some kind of accumulation property if you play, uh, if it is a balls which are well distributed in the space. If you have balls which are living on co-dimension two sets, then you don't have any accumulation properties. But say if you have like very well distributed balls, like for instance, you take a lattice of balls, then you should expect some kind of true additivity property. That's what we expect. And it's something that we don't really know except for two dimensional case. In a two dimensional case, there is just uh, a comparison theorem which tells us that the frequency in the ball is roughly the length of the zero sets divided by the radius. So the frequency should be 
ideologically comparable to um, d minus one dimensional measure of the zero sets divided by the scaling factor. And it's a non-trivial property that this frequency is a monotone and has some additivity properties, and it helps a lot to study the zero set. So this kind of thing is unknown in dimension three and higher, uh, but it gives us some kind of intuition about additivity properties of the frequency. Um, so how much time do I have? Infinite. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So here is some kind of summary. What do we know about the frequency? Um, but the things I didn't formulate them for Riemannian manifold, but it's true that there is also a similar notion of frequency for Riemannian manifold that's also monotone in some sense and also possesses some weak versions of additivity properties. Um, and uh, using that, you can tell something about the distribution of values of harmonic functions on manifolds. So here is a statement which is local. It's not about behavior of harmonic functions near infinity. It's a statement about behavior of harmonic functions in a ball. And if you know the frequency of a harmonic function in a ball, that it's roughly like a polynomial of degree A, then you can estimate the distribution of values of a harmonic function. You can say how large is the set or, or, or how small is the set where the harmonic function is smaller than some number epsilon. And this is the bound, exactly the same bound that you would have for polynomials. And that's roughly a polynomial. If you normalize a polynomial that's, uh, it's a is maximum is one, then the measure of the set where the polynomial is smaller than epsilon is roughly epsilon to the power one over degree. And the same fact is true for harmonic functions on Riemannian manifolds, but here instead of the degree, you have the frequency. Um, so uh, it's not clear, okay, how this fact is helpful, but this fact can be extended to Laplace eigenfunctions and it really helps to understand locally the number of nodal domains. Um, and I will not try to explain this connection, why this quantitative estimate tells us something about the topology. Why does it gives us, say, simplest thing, the estimate of the number of nodal cores or, or for the number of nodal domains? Um, I would, okay, so there was an announcement and I have to uh, follow the abstract that there will be some uh, conversation about uh, analytic tools, which help to study linear PDE. So if we want to understand the distribution of values of solutions to PDE, there are uh, usually people use uh, two kinds of tools. One of them was already mentioned, which is very powerful. Um, Montanicity formulas. There is another tool uh, which is called roughly integration by parts. And you can do something with integration by parts, not too much, but you can prove uh, some kind of inequalities for solutions of PDE just by integration by parts. Uh, here is an example of a Carliman inequality. It looks something like you can estimate. Uh, the norms of the function by the norms of the derivatives of the function. Um, and uh, uh, both of the problems are kind of, they have some applications for local problems, like say on small scale problems, on, but it's very hard to use them to get some optimal results for large scale problems. Also the Carliman inequalities, they are, not easy to apply in high dimensions. They usually. Oh yeah. Okay. So it's okay. So truth be told, Carliman inequalities are inequalities that usually formal formulation occupies more than a blackboard, and there is some kind of mysterious function phi, 
And then there are like long conditions on phi, which kind of functions phi can you plug in here? And uh, if I try to simplify, it's kind of convexity condition of phi. It should be like, like not really convexity, but co convexity-like properties should be hold for phi. And the conditions, they are very long and they depend on the differential operator that you use and they are almost impossible to apply. So the Carleman inequalities, uh, people use them mostly for weights phi, which are say, depend only on one of the direction, very simple weights you can actually apply it to. If you want some complicated weight, which takes account uh, into account the behavior of a function in several locations of the manifold, you fail miserably. It's good for, okay, for behavior of the function near one point or for the behavior of the function in one direction. That's the best you can get out of Carleman inequalities. But if you want to play some more complicated things, you look at this kind of conditions and you cannot apply them. And later I will mention a problem where the Carleman inequalities do not give you the optimal results. They give you something which is far from the truth. And uh, it's kind of philosophical point that you cannot prove every statement in analysis just integrating by parts. Uh, uh, okay, so here is a, uh, a problem. I'm sorry, this is very analytic problem, but about very simple PDE. Uh, it's, this problem is called Landis conjecture. Um, it's about solution to the following equation, like Laplace of u plus some kind of potential times u equals zero. And the potential, yeah, you can, it could be a constant, then it will be eigenfunction. Or now you allow the function v, this potential to be anywhere between minus one and one, any bounded measurable function. Uh, and uh, Landis, he was wondering uh, what kind of behavior it must have, it may have near infinity. Can it behave very crazy near infinity? Like say okay, here crazy means that it goes to zero extremely fast, faster than exponentially. And he conjectured several things. Like first he was very adventurous said that it should not decay faster than exponent with a large constant in the argument, then he wondered, he noted that it's not even known that it cannot decay like e to the minus x to the power one plus epsilon. And there are also two different settings of this problem, like real setting when the potential is real and there is a setting when the potential is complex. Here in this talk, like all functions, they were real and will talk about the first setting. Uh, but first let me give an example like about exponential decay. So say you have just two variables, x1 and x2, and you take the function e to the x1, it solves a PD, two-dimensional PD. It's Laplacian is um, like, you, you, you differentiate the exponent, you get it again. You differentiate it twice, you get it again. So it's, uh, eigenfunction with eigenvalue one. Okay, not, and, uh, but it's like not integrable, not, not true eigenfunction. If you go to the left, it decays exponentially. It decays exponentially in one of the direction. It does not decay in all of the direction, but you can ask the same question, how fast solution to the PD can decay in, in a half plane in one direction? And it's actually not difficult to cook up an example which decays in all directions, say you start with the function e to the minus absolute value of x, it decays exponentially. But the problem with this function is that it's not smooth near the origin like this. Um, and, but say if you step a little far away from the origin, like say outside of the unit ball, then it solves this differential inequality that the Laplacian of it divided by u is bounded. And you can define the potential to be just Laplace u divided by u. 
And inside of the unit ball, okay, your function is not smooth, but you just take any smooth positive extension and uh, you have a positive function smooth. If when you look at Laplace u divided by u, if the thing that you divide is positive, then this ratio is bounded. So it's yeah, just any way to extend this function in a smooth way gives you uh, a solution to a PDE with uh, bounded potential. And uh, Landis, he conjectured that this is the worst thing that can happen near infinity. The decay cannot be faster than exponential. Um, uh, so here is a toy problem, okay, uh, uh, about harmonic functions, uh, which is very relevant to the previous one. So the toy problem is about harmonic functions, not on the plane, but on the plane with a lot of holes. Uh, so holes could be anywhere. They have a unit size and they're separated from each other but you don't know where they are. They could be like a lattice of holes or it could be like half a lattice of balls. Uh, they are separated from each other. So there is some kind of analysis near each hole, its own territory. And assume now that you have a harmonic function which is defined outside of the holes. And suddenly you have a very strange condition. It does not change sign in the analysis around each of the holes. So there is analysis near the hole. The harmonic function could be either positive or negative near the hole. Inside of the hole, it's not defined. It's defined in a punctured plane. And then you ask the same kind of question, how fast a harmonic function can decay near the infinity? How fast can it go to zero? Uh, so, uh, at the moment may seem like very strange. Why do you have holes? How is it relevant? One problem is about harmonic functions. Another problem uh, is uh, about solutions to a slightly more difficult PD. And uh, uh, the truth is there is a kind of trick that takes uh, a solution to a more complicated PD uh, and uh, cooks up a solution to a simpler PD. And uh, so you kind of you kill the potential, but the price that you pay, you have to introduce holes. Uh, and also in this process, you lose in some way the logarithm. Some... But after, if you solve the toy problem, uh, the answer in the toy problem is kind of, yeah, the harmonic function can decay faster than exponentially. You can answer the question about solutions uh, to the equation with potential and you lose on the way some logarithm, but it's still pretty good. Uh, I, I think I, I will not be able to tell you like, how does it work? It's very funny thing. So, uh, so here is a picture of Nikolai Nadirashvili. And uh, when Nikolai Nadirashvili was having a birthday party, there was a conference uh, celebrating his uh, 65th birthday. And Fetya Nazarov uh, was kind to provide this picture. So when uh, Nadirashvili, he was trying to solve uh, a different problem, but 30 years ago, he was talking about this idea of introducing calls for 30 years. And uh, after 30 years, this kind of wonderful idea found an application. And I think that I will stop here. This is a picture of Diablo Rayo in winter. Please come back here. Any questions or comments? Uh, could you still say some words like this transformation from uh, uh, on the Laplace equation, on the domain with holes and like some kind of whatever Schrodinger equation or whatever it is, right on the mm -hmm. on, on the full domain, 
uh, roughly how, how does it work? Is it an explicit transformation which maps solutions to solutions? Or is it some existence argument? Or what, what, what kind of... Uh, uh -huh. It sounds very mysterious, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. So, so some hint for us to mm -hmm. think about on the way back. Yeah, so I'm, I must say that this kind of transformation, it's uh, not an explicit formal like a change of coordinates. For each solution, it's constructed individually and it's kind of depends on the original solution. But uh, the good thing about this transformation, it's very quantitative. You can see how like the distances between the points are changed. So, and how, how much the function is deformed and the function is actually the perturbation of the function it could be multiplied by a constant between one half and two so it's basically the same function up to this multiplication factor and some kind of change of coordinates which is controlled like you can estimate how the distances between points is changed and the estimates are kind of universal they don't depend on the solution or they, they, they but kind of Sorry, but what you're saying is very nice, but just, just to understand, is there some formula that you can it's not, show us? It's, it, it's, it's not a formula. Okay, so it's some kind of uh, a change of variables, which is, uh, okay, together with uh, some other things like multiplication by a function. It's not a formula in the sense that, uh, yeah, it's given something that you can calculate, but on the same moment there are quantitative estimates how bad are distortions and the distortions are kind of good they are kind of uniform over all solutions but the distortions they are kind of every time they are different but they have uniform estimates like so you can apply it for everyone if you are interested in inequalities it does not matter but if you would like to calculate things explicitly no <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Dima. So, this kind of distortion technique it relies very much on so called quasi conformal mappings which are only two dimensional. And unfortunately, all, all that I said about Landis conjecture, it's a very good open problem in three dimensions. And uh, yeah, the argument completely breaks down in dimension three. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. It's, yeah, it's, it's only two. Oh yeah, there is some estimate that comes from Carleman inequalities, which is e to the minus x to the power four thirds. And it's conjecture that it could be improved to the e to the uh, minus x to the power one plus epsilon. So you can go from four thirds to one. Um, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I'm going back to this setting what we call quantum hybridism. Mm -hmm. So, so you are setting uh, eigen eigen function of Laplace in very large eigenvalues. So, so for me that translates into wave functions of particles with very high energy moving on that manifold. So that I, I think I understood more or less that. If the manifold generates some chaotic classical dynamic, you expect wave function to be very low covariance, and that's what justifies this, uh, this objection. Mm -hmm. But then I did not understand then why you had to restrict to this hyperbolic manifold. Why can't you treat the same manifold that generates the chaotic? So, so can you also say something about that more generally? Yeah, so the truth is, yeah, the most interesting manifolds in terms of applications. Uh, okay, some of the applications like number theory applications, um, mostly concerning uh, uh, the constant curvature to dimensional surfaces. And for instance, you can try to understand like L infinity bounds and it will give like very nice results in number theory. 
like understanding like behavior of the Riemann zeta function along the very interesting axis, um, like how fast it grows. But um, and uh, it's kind of believed that this uh, dynamical structure, like that, it helps a lot, uh, but. Um, so that, that part is true, though, that it's very interesting when it's constant negative curvature. And if you do something there, if you know how to use the uh, curvature and Simon Gatlov, Jean Bergen, and Gina Nonnermacher, they did a huge advancement there. It's very interesting result that they obtained. I had to mention that. Um, it's still, um, um, well, but later what I was talking, yeah, I stepped from the very interesting problem to less interesting problem, if you like, but uh, it's more like a problem about high dimensions, like obstacles that appear in high dimensions. No, quantum ergodicity is just one problem. And there are other problems that I started to talk and they're mostly concerning understanding of higher dimensions. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a separate topic like to quantum ergodicity. And this one is, um, I don't know, it might be interesting from other point, but say yeah, from number theory points of view, yeah, that case is probably the most interesting. Question. I was I was wondering because uh, it sounds a bit like typical machine learning where you kind of question like how many classification you have to set and like depending on how many uh, connected components in the sense it would be more difficult to classify you would need more data and it's also related to the fact that classification like if you have the if you know like high frequency uh, things are more difficult to learn and so it sounds a bit like this because seem to say that high frequency uh, of function would be would have more of separated components and so it's kind of more difficult to learn. But uh, so I was wondering whether it's easy to extend this kind of results that about how many of these components you have, but not only for uh, um, or not only when that you have the for eigen functions, but maybe you know a function has a certain decay that there's less signal only in these high frequencies. Could you also say things about how many like complex mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's it's a, it's it's a good question like yeah so about the complexity like the number of none of them is just kind of a local attempt to make like some kind of local domain it's an attempt to understand the complexity of the thing and yeah we truly believe that there is some kind of complexity estimate the question is how you define the complexity yeah that's yeah it's you're very welcome it's if if you know the, the the proper way how to define the complexity you, you like the philosophical point that view that you should expect that the facts about complexity that are true for polynomials they should be true to some extent for eigenfunctions and this kind of monotonicity formulas they kind of yeah they help a little bit but <laughs> There are so many questions that I'm not sure there is enough time to sign your analysis for the, the conference. I counted that there were 18 talks, and not only you, but me, and we, we have to go. So, and I hope so. You, you, you think we should thank ourselves, right? Or, or, or what's the other? <laughs> I, I hope that this research station, which is about it's like a space station. Uh, we live very long and we did see many good other uh, conferences here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would also add a warm round of applause to our speakers of today and to all the speakers and all participants of the meeting. So thanks a lot for coming. I think normally we should have general meetings from now on here in the Diabdere, probably in this room, but also we'll be using for other meetings the room that we saw 
on Monday. So yeah, please do come to the research station here. I'd like to join from here. And thanks a lot. That was the end of the meeting.